Welcome to our talk on communication, porting your thoughts. Um, basically, today we're going to be talking about the different ways that you can better understand the people that you're working with in your team uh, to avoid issues, um, any assumptions being made, and to ensure that your products get made a little bit faster, a little bit less chaos, less burning furniture, you know, all the usual kind of stuff. <laughs> um, when we heard the, the topic for this year, um, it came down to the fact that there's a lot of things that we think we get across when we're talking to other people. We feel as though when we're saying something, wearing, wearing, blah, blah, words, communication. <laughs> we feel like we're wearing a big sign on ourselves that are clearly stating the points that we're trying to get across. But really, there's a lot of things that get in the way of that. There are walls that form up um, based on assumptions and misunderstandings, and then half of our message get co gets covered. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about those kinds of things. Buttons. Hmm. Just, yeah. Amos will do this. Good. So who are we? I'm Jess Watson. This is Amos Wolf. <laughs> oh, nope. Let's keep it. <laughs> <laughs> We're WA-based game developers, uh, and we've worked together on a variety of projects at a variety of different studios. Um, we're very different in communication styles and personalities, but we get along really well and work towards uh, figuring out our problems whenever they come up. So we actually often will sit down and debrief on situations or talk through issues that we've had to better understand them. Uh, so we thought we would bring that here today. Feel free to tag us on Twitter anytime you mention any cool quotes we say because I will literally forget them as soon as they happen. Uh, so this way I can remember what I talked about as well. All right. Mm -hmm. cool. Yes, Amos will press the buttons. Good. Hello everyone, I'm Amos Wolf. I'm a gameplay programmer at Black Lab Games. I've worked on games with a variety of different features. This includes uh, space strategy games like Battlestar Galactica Deadlock to chill puzzle games such as Symphony of the Machine. I started working on my first complete games at university that which involved uh, apps and serious games. This includes an augmented reality app called Trailblazer, which I think you can see at the, at the bottom of the screen. and uh, Abydos, which was a serious game designed to teach fractions. I've also worked on projects outside of my work. I worked with, uh, I worked with Hien on uh, It Will Be Hard, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is an interactive comic, so I worked on the interactive uh, element of it. And that wall jumping mobile game in the center, I worked with Jess, which is called uh, Hyper Smash Heroes. Yes, I'm still Jess. Um, I, as Amos mentioned, so we worked on a mobile game together called Hyper Dash Heroes slash Hyper Smash. We never finished our name for it. It's fine. Um, I've also worked with him on Battlestar Galactica Deadlock um, and on Symphony of, Symphony of the Machine with Stir Fire Studios, although we were in different areas. Uh, other than that, I've also worked uh, on Starhammer for Black Lab Games, uh, a variety of virtual reality uh, and motion capture related projects with Edith Cowan University. Uh, where I assist them with their motion capture lab and various bits and pieces and do teaching. Um, but actually, before I went into the games industry, I originally worked in the health space. Uh, I studied psychology and uh, went through the counselling space. Um, but I'm not a psychologist and I am definitely not a counsellor, so don't take that away from it. Uh, the reason I mention it is because going through that first before coming into game design, uh, there are a lot of aspects I take for granted that I look into when I have conversations with people. Um, there's ways of talking and ways of engaging with people where I'm like, oh, this is obvious. And then after a time I realised, hmm, maybe this is not obvious. So that's what we wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is definitely your job. <laughs> so what are we talking about? In the interest of clarity, because this is a talk on communication, we thought we'd go through the list of things we're going to cover. So, Amos, next slide. <laughs> communication and knowledge sharing styles. So basically, adjusting the mic, because um, I'm quite short. There's a variety of different ways that we can cl classify our own communication styles and the way that we give knowledge to others. And by understanding these, we can better see where we and other people are having a disconnect. Uh, common scenarios, so Amos and I are actually going to talk about instances where we've had conflicts or um, had them with other people and what could have caused that. So you can have sort of real life scenarios. Boop. Practical tips, so we will go through some actual dot points of like here's stuff you can try at home, which is always very useful. And next bit, what we're not talking about. All right, meetings do not solve everything. Don't worry, we're not going to be like, yes, you should all meet together and talk about it because that's terrible often. <laughs> we're not going to go through an exact list of don't say this, don't say that. Um, we're going to be talking about styles where there's no wrong, one wrong, 
wrong or right answer. It's just more about understanding. And there's not uh, a situation where it's like, oh, yes, if only you knew how to speak programmer, you would be able to communicate to them. Uh, it's not that we're talking different languages, although no doubt some of the programmers in the room would uh, disagree with that concept. But we will be coming together as one. All right. Cool. So first psychology type concept. Um, I'm including the journals that I refer to down the bottom just in case anybody likes that kind of stuff, because I know I do. Uh, so communication styles basically are not saying that you are definitely this type of person or that type of person. They're a format, a descriptor for a way that we communicate, the, how our values relate to that and how our pace relates to that. So by understanding it, we can say, okay, I see where we have differences. We can work around that. So activity time, you don't... Oh, yep, no, sorry. that's fine. Yep, yep, yep. All right, so <laughs> to help you classify yourself in a communication style, just think about how you work with people in a game development setting. So when you're working on a project, are you focusing more on the people in the group? So how is everyone interacting? How are people feeling? Where are they at with their projects? Or are you more task oriented? So where are we in the grand scheme of things? How am I doing on my jobs? How is this person doing on their jobs? Think about which one you're more focused on. It's okay if you're not focused on one super. Next one. The other scale that we look at is someone's pace. Do you like to take your time to do something? You prefer it to be perfect? You take a while to confer with other people? Then you're probably on the slower pace. Or are you faster? Do you like efficiency, productivity? You like to get things done within a fair amount of time and then do more things. Think about which ones those associate with you. All right. Boop. This relates into four quadrants. Um, so there are uh, effectively different ways where you are people focused in the way you think or you're task focused. And you can work at a slow pace or a fast pace, as I discussed. Press the button. Yes. This relates to four areas of communication styles. So there's amiable, expressive, analytical, and driver. Um, an amiable person will get along well with an analytical person because they're both doing things at a similar pace. So you want to make sure something's really right. You can discuss it out, figure it out. Amiable people will get along quite well with an expressive person because you're very people focused. You like to engage with one another, make friends, see where they're sitting at. Um, next one. So you're more likely to interact well. Ah, oh, the pitch didn't work in the middle. So sad. You're more likely to interact well with someone who you have something in common with in your in terms of your communication styles. Alternately, people where you don't actually have a, a linked point for your communication styles, you're more likely to come to a head with them. So if you're an amiable person, you like to take your time to work on something, you like to talk out problems, it's very likely that someone who's a driver, who's, yep, task oriented, get things done efficiently, move on to the next thing, you're going to be coming to, hopefully not blows, but loggerheads, trying to talk things out because you don't quite come to things from the same point. So we'll get through this. Um, next, I'm just going to give you like some little examples of how that might turn out in a person. So you can think about the people around you and where you sit. So I'm just going to move up a little bit so I can see my notes. <laughs> so an amiable person. Uh, this isn't exact, not everybody is the same, but one example is an amiable person could value getting to know other people, cooperating, participating, inclusion, uh, the opinions of others. It's like, yeah, great stuff. They might bug other people because they take a lot of time to actually come to a decision. They talk to everybody else first. And they don't necessarily express how they're feeling about a matter. It's more about what the group feels. An example of an expressive person. So they like building connections, uh, like being enthusiastic, friendly. That's really important to them. Um, they like being flexible and spontaneous and doing things on the go. But that can actually also annoy people because maybe they're impulsive and they take risks. Uh, maybe they don't think out the details of the plan quite as well. An analytical person, they're quick thinking, but they take time to consider their response. So it'll be a while before they'll give you an answer. Uh, they make sure that their information is accurate. They like to have clear plans and deadlines. But at the same time, they can be a bit of a perfectionist sometimes. Uh, and maybe they're overly cautious, or when the structure isn't there, they panic. And an example of a driver is that they like efficiency, effectiveness, stability, reliability, being assertive. Um, but perhaps conferring with other people is not their strong point. Maybe they get impatient with others that do and they just want things done. So hopefully you can kind of see maybe someone who you have a, a linkage with. Again, it's not exact. It's not like, oh, well, that's not me exactly, so that doesn't work. Uh, but for those of you who don't really find something that you associate with, I would recommend thinking of the Harry Potter Hogwarts houses. They align quite well, interestingly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's a helpful point. Again. These aren't saying that, yes, you're definitely this kind of person. It's like, oh, you're such a Leo. It's more, this is a good way to describe what you value, 
how much time you take, and then seeing what somebody else values and where you can go from there. So style flexing is the psychological term for trying to talk the talk of another person. Um, so sometimes communication issues can come up because you're saying something, but that's not what the other person's hearing. Or you're saying something and they don't understand why that's important. They're like, no, 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 that's not relevant. This is what I'm doing. Um, so by using the right terminology, you can actually kind of sometimes smooth over those complications. <laughs> Next one. So there's ways you can ask questions. You don't always have to ask them in this format, but they can be beneficial if you're finding you're having trouble communicating with someone. So an amiable person, they like who questions. So who have you considered in creating accessibility features? For an expressive person, how questions are really great. So how are we going to make our game accessible? Analytical, why? Why are we implementing features in this way? And a driver, what? What are, out are the outcomes we're working towards with this feature? So you're assessing the same thing, but you're using a question that works towards what that person will be thinking of first. Again, this is, it's not like, yes, you have to use this format, but if talking's not working, try this out. All right, tip section. So for producers and leads, um, it's the more you understand about the kinds of dynamics for people in your group, the better it is you can plan things out. So you can make sure that people are working with others who will support them in their way of uh, doing things, or that any areas that they have st struggling in, that there's someone else from another area that can support them. You can use your understanding to mediate conflicts um, and talk out the differences which is really good, and you can talk it out by not laying blame, because that's super important. It's not like, well, your style sucks. It's more like, okay, you're saying this, you're saying that, why aren't we understanding the same thing? How can we work through that? And by recognizing the pace that somebody works at based on their communication style, um, you can work with their schedule and how it lines up with other people's schedules so that they're not getting annoyed at each other because someone's waiting on another person, or they feel like they're not getting enough time to do a project. All right, what does this look like in the real world? Ems. So while Jess and I were working on our mobile game, a lot of the time we'd have brainstorming sessions. Um, and Jess is more expressive and I'm, I'm more task focused. So this resulted in us interpreting things a little bit differently. A lot of the time Jess would ask the question, can we do this? As in, uh, she was thinking about the different things that we could do um, and then collect all the things we could do and then go from there and create tasks from there. For me, I was kind of hearing the questions as, can you do this please? As in a checklist of different things that I needed to do. So at the end of a lot of our meetings, I'd go away and I'd implement absolutely everything. I'd implement everything that was talked <laughs> in the meeting, come back, it would be completely different. Jess would be completely shocked because it just, it was nothing like the um, original game. <laughs> And so, yeah, in these cases, it really helps to kind of uh, communicate. I lost the mouse. <laughs> no. Oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so what are some ways that we can get around this? Uh, for programmers, note that when a designer talks to you, they're not always delegating tasks. Sometimes they're actually trying to talk through an idea and try to figure something out. Uh, it's always good to talk to um, people in different fields to try to figure out your ideas. Note that they might also, they might have or also figured out the idea for themselves, but they want you to know so you can think about it in the back of your head. Um, at the end of your meetings, it's always good to, uh, you know, confirm what are you doing, like in terms of what tasks you're doing. You might be surprised and find out that you're not actually supposed to be implementing anything at the end. It's just for them to figure something out. Uh, a lot of the time when I started programming, I got asked to do features that were eventually cut. Um, I originally got annoyed about this, but uh, cut features are a part of game development because it's iterative and experimental. Um, so it's a lot better to think of cut features as research instead of wasted time. Also, communication should take a while, so you shouldn't actually rush through it. Therefore, you should actually factor it into your scheduled tasks. So if you're estimating the time for your task, you shouldn't just estimate the amount of time it will take you to implement it. You should actually estimate the time that it takes to ask questions and figure things out. Cool. So for designers, uh, if you're thinking about having a brainstorming session, it's good to start with saying, I'm just trying to figure things out. There's no tasks that are uh, coming out of this meeting, and then they're more likely to get on board. 
try to cement that afterwards. So just in case it's not clear that, you know, it is still a brainstorming session at the end and that there was no tasks involved. If there are tasks, then of course, create a list of them. And then try to prioritize those tasks because all of the time you might think, oh, it's obvious that it should be done in this order, but people think differently from you. So it's always good to assign it in the order you think they should be done in. Scenario two. Okay, so Jess and I took a really long time with our game. It hasn't actually come out. This is partly due to the fact we just kept uh, polishing things, changing the jump speed, ch changing the uh, animations and stuff. Um, and it's mainly due to the fact that we're both on the low assertive end in terms of communication styles. We didn't really have that drive to go, okay, it needs to be finished at this time. So, I mean, there are some ways around that. So. So if you're a perfectionist, it's always good to have an iterative design system. So uh, if you're an artist, it's good to have a minimum viable product that you are okay with before showing it to people. For programmers, try to come up with a rough draft instead of uh, just adding polishes straight away. Then you know, relay, relay it to the team and add on it. Um, and yeah, make sure that you have a certain amount in mind so it just doesn't become an endless loop. It's always good to keep yourself updated on other people's tasks. So there's different ways you can do this, Scrum and uh, using Scrums and stuff like that to try to um, figure out what other people are doing. It's always good to figure out what if someone else is blocked. So for instance, if you need to design something first before someone is able to work on it, it's always good to know that so you can switch over and so they can actually work on it. Also, if your priorities change and you think different things should be worked on, it's good to update your team about that. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of wasted time. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, in my variety of things that I've done, uh, QA, both QA management and doing testing myself was one of those spaces. Um, so as a more expressive sort of side amiable person, I like talking to other people. I like being like, oh, what do you think of this? That's interesting. Let's talk it out. This can be annoying. Next one, yes. Actually, I'm gonna do this one. That's interactive, but not really. Um, so say, you know, you've got a question relating to a QA thing or something you're checking out. Sometimes it can be really helpful to ask. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Is it supposed to be doing that? That's fine, it's only taking 30 seconds. Cool, come in again, got another question. Oh, oh this is interesting. Is this related to the latest update? Is it something I need to uh, be testing? Yes, just test it. Oh, I've got another question. Um, okay, so this new system that you integrated, blah, 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 blah. They're like, it's fine, they've got some time. Somebody's probably also interrupting them in this period. They're like, it's cool, cool, they've had a break. Anyway, new question. Um, <laughs> what do you think about me logging it like this? It's like, just do it. So there are things you can do and there are things other people can do to be less interrupting when you're really enthusiastic about just checking in occasionally. So yeah. The first thing um, you should actually do before asking someone a question is actually ask yourself some questions first. So is it an immediate issue? A lot of the time we might think something is completely urgent. For QA, you might, like standard procedure might go out the window. As soon as you see a bug, you think, oh, I need to let someone know straight away. It's usually good to test it a few times um, and make sure that it's reproducible and that it's not, you know, like an edge case or something. Uh, for anyone else on the team, it, sometimes you look at something and you think it immediately blocks you from doing, like working on anything else. If you think about it for a little bit, you might actually figure out that, oh, I can actually work on something else in the meantime. Um, if you can, then it's always good to write that down. Also, uh, make sure that you ask the right person. There's been times where I've asked an artist a question that's clearly been meant for a programmer or a designer and it's just led to confusion. Uh, a lot of times you might have a question that uh, someone else in the same field as you can answer. In these cases, it's always good to kind of phrase the problem in your head. I know sometimes verbalizing it can help figure out the issue, but a lot of times I can ask, I've asked questions and answered them at the same time and it's only annoyed people. Uh, don't underestimate the, um, the effect that having a break can do. So there's been times where I've spent maybe like two hours on a task and just a five minute break is I've just immediately come up with a solution. Uh, if you have a lot of questions that can be asked later, it's always good to like write them down for later. This can reduce the amount of meetings that you have. 
Do note that the context is important. So if you barge in, ask a question, someone's likely working on something completely different and they're not going to understand what you're saying. So it's usually good to start with what you're working on, what the problem is, and then go to the actual question itself. Also, uh, don't expect an answer immediately, especially if it's complicated. Sometimes you might need multiple meetings. So you might say, oh, do you want to talk about this later? If you're on the receiving end of all these questions, uh, it's if you're and you're annoyed about it, it's important <laughs> not to be uh, too eager to answer every uh, question immediately. This can send the message that it's okay to interrupt you at any time. Also, if you don't tell them that it's an issue, then they're not really going to change their behavior. In the case where you are annoyed about questions, it's good to go through the same steps with their questions as you do with yours. So if you find that they're asking you a lot of important questions, it, you might actually need to update your documentation. If they're asking you a lot of questions that could be asked later, then you could suggest to them, hey, maybe you could um, compile these questions down for later. New concept. OK, wipe your brains. Communication styles, done, check. We understand that. Awesome. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is knowledge sharing styles and behaviours. Um, so basically, in a workplace environment, um, sharing knowledge is good. Uh, it's the kind of thing that fosters a positive environment. Uh, better ideas come out. Uh, everyone works better as a team. So lots of studies, they're all like, yeah, sharing knowledge is great. There are two elements to this. So knowledge donating is effectively where we give out information. Knowledge share, uh, knowledge collecting, different word. Knowledge collecting is where you take on the information and incorporate it into your own knowledge. Um, so these are things that we want to encourage. You want a workplace with high knowledge sharing. And there are two different key styles that people use. So I'm going to keep using these guys because I was copy-pasting. It was a bit lazy. But we know we're talking about styles because stylish glasses. Yes, artist. All right, so one style is called eagerness. It's effectively when someone um, has a lot of value in sharing capital. So they go, oh, a topic's come up. I have knowledge on this topic. I will give it to you. Uh, a person with an eagerness style will expect that other people will also do that. So they're not seeing it necessarily as interrupting. It's about sharing the information because they value having information and they value it if other people give them stuff that they can collect. Um, unfortunately, sometimes this can get a bit much. Lots of sharing, lots of sharing. Um, so a person sharing uh, with eagerness is mostly impacted by their own belief in their performance. So if they're in a group where they feel like they're in a senior position or they have a lot of knowledge on the area, they're more likely to jump in. And that's great. We, we don't want to say none of these styles are bad. They're all good. It's just about making sure that uh, there's a good management between all the styles and everyone's aware of how they work. Other stuff like if you're happy with your job and if other people on your team are loud or not will affect how much someone's going to give out information. The other side is willingness. So a person with a willingness to share information will also give out the information, but mostly only if they're asked. What they're paying more attention to is how the rest of the room is going. So um, this relates mostly to agreeableness. So if the rest of the people in the group, it's like, ah, oh, I feel these people value my opinion, I feel like I could be helpful to the team and I want to help the team, then they're more likely to give up their information. But they might not necessarily step in immediately because they're like, oh, yes, knowledge to share. Um, so again, no good or bad. Sometimes if someone has a willingness style, they might not jump in when it would be a good time because nobody's asked them. And eagerness, maybe they jump in a bit too much. Everything in moderation. Tips. So this mostly, we'll start with general meeting tips because meetings are so fun, um, because someone's knowledge sharing style can impact a lot on meetings. Yeah. So it's always good to keep the meeting structured. So it, having a central location for this, such as a projector or whiteboard, although I prefer a whiteboard as it allows people to draw diagrams and stuff, is always good to give each person a chance to talk. Um, a lot of people that are eager will be more likely to talk uh, than people that have a willingness. Uh, this kind of hurts the project if only a few people speak, because you kind of need the collective intelligence of the entire group. So if you find that a topic is passed and someone or someone else is talking, it's always good to write a question down for later. Also, it, shooting it down other peop, uh, people's ideas, especially if they have a willingness, can make them way less likely to share ideas in future. So uh, don't do that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and um, you know, if needed, let, let's say you, uh, you ask the group a complex question, 
uh, give them about maybe two minutes or something to write those questions down and then you can go around and actually see what people think. Also, face-to-face uh, -face communication isn't always possible. Sometimes you need to communicate online. In these cases, you still should have some form of meetings in the form of you know, video or voice chat. Um, this just allows you to set milestones and allow you, you to show the other people on the project what you're working on. Real world example. What does eagerness and willingness look like? Mostly this. So this particular example um, doesn't relate to Amos necessarily. Actually, another developer who I asked permission to talk to about this. Um, so basically, lots of scenarios where you're doing art or design and you're working on something and as an expressive person, I'm like, hey, I'm working on this thing. I'm feeling really good about it. Cool. I will just tell people. Not necessarily seeking feedback. I've had instances before where it's like, oh, here's a very early concept for a section. Um, look, we've got a nice wood grain background. Look at this, look at that. Um, and a friend was like, huh, that wood grain isn't appropriate for that context. I did a class in year 10 that involved woodworking and that wood grain is not correct. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much, very helpful. I appreciate your eagerness to give me information. Um, in that situation, they felt it was, oh, this is helpful information for you. Um, I am aware of this general area. You might want to be aware of this general area. Um, but I didn't necessarily clarify that, like, oh, this is a very, very, very early draft concept. I'm just playing around. I just want to show you because I'm happy because I finished a thing. Um, yeah, talking stuff out. It's good. It's always good to ask someone if they want advice first. So a lot of the time someone might be just starting a task or they um, have a rough draft, so they know most of the issues behind it. Um, so just... Be mindful that not every conversation requires your input. Some people are just showing people where they're at because that's what you do in meetings. Um, if you're on the receiving end of all this, it's important to tell people not so much that you don't want their advice, but that you're not ready to receive uh, feedback on it, on your task yet. A lot of the times I find myself wanting to get back to work as soon as possible. However, this is not really helpful if the information and tasks are unclear. So you need to talk to each person and figure out they, if they know uh, what tasks they're going to work on first uh, before continuing. If they don't know, then that needs to be figured out. Also, if you find that you're uh, eager and you like sharing a lot of information, you can actually use this for good. You can direct them to uh, if someone that's if they're more knowledgeable than you about a particular thing. For instance, let's say you're a programmer and you're giving someone advice about art styles, animation or game design, it's at that point that you could say, you could give them advice that you could give them, but for the art styles and animation, you could say, oh, I think Jess is good to talk to about this. Uh, bonus tip, uh, tip for QA, a lot of the time, uh, uh, people will state the solution without stating the problem first. It's always good to explain what the actual bug is first before trying to figure out a solution. Um, that, so an example for this, let's say in Battlestar uh, Galactica, someone said, oh, um, one of the ships are moving too slow. Uh, that would be an example of a solution. But if they were to say, oh, in level five, I'm not able to reach the objective in time because the ship is too slow, the designers can actually do a lot more with that. They can either choose to speed that ship up or they can choose to bring the objective closer in that particular level. So it's always good to start with um, the problem first. And then if you want to include a solution, sure, but yeah, include the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're on the management side of the QA process, uh, you can use the way that you train people or the feedback forms uh, in order to filter the information that comes through. So you can give them a section where it's like, you know, yes, the key steps you did, what is the actual problem? And then have a section where it's like, yes, what do you think needs to be fixed? Um, you can choose to ignore that. But you're giving people an avenue where they can get their eagerness out. They're like, yes, I want to provide you with this information, um, but still, you know, acknowledging that they want to do that and they'll find a way to insert that information somewhere. Cool, final concept. There's a lot of things we could have discussed, but we overarching type things. So active listening. Um, 
Active listening is actually something we've effectively covered through the concepts we've talked about with our tips. Um, things like asking questions and trying to make sure your point is clear uh, is a really key points in it. Um, a lot of times when people think of active listening, they're like, mm, yes, you repeat what somebody says and go, mm, that's really interesting and not a lot. Um, it's helpful <laughs> if you're doing it for real. If you're not, it's really obvious. <laughs> so we'll just go through some active listening things uh, that you can use in general situations. Um, so it's really important to understand, uh, ensure the content is understood by both parties. So this can be on the end of the listener where you're, you are repeating back things like, oh, okay, so I need to blah, 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 blah. It's like, oh, no, actually, you should have been doing this. Um, so by repeating it back, they'll correct you if you've misunderstood it. Um, alternatively, as the person giving out information, uh, if something is misunderstood, don't go, ha, what an idiot. Instead, reword the way you said it because uh, obviously the way you're explaining it doesn't align to what they need to know or what, what their communication style is. Asking questions, always good. Um, avoiding distractions can be really useful. Things like making eye contact, taking notes if it's appropriate, basically letting the other person know that you're invested in the conversation with someone. Um, is that, wait, yes, one more points, sorry. Um, if you're not able to do that, like say you're not comfortable with eye contact, that's okay. It's all about having an open dialogue. So let the person know, look, I'm really interested in what you're saying. I'm not super comfortable with eye contact, but I am listening or nodding or something else. As long as they know that, yes, they are paying attention to me in some format, that's great. Um, and try not to think about exactly what you're going to say as soon as they finish talking. Um, so we respond to information quite quickly. If someone says something, our brain's figured it out before they've finished talking. So often you can be like, oh, that's a really good point. I'm going to tell them about this, that, the other, blah, 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 blah. We kind of miss what's going on or things go awry. Uh, so try and use the time where they're saying things to think in your head that you're understanding what they're saying. Maybe try the rewording then um, rather than jumping in about how you can contribute back. Cool. Scenario. So while Jess and I were working on our mobile game, uh, there were a lot of situations where we didn't communicate enough. In this scenario, it resulted in me creating a uh, Unity editor tool that was all text-based and really confusing to use. So the game itself started uh, procedural, so it was um, you know, created with code. A lot of the time it would be designed, you'd say, oh, I want to create this obstacle at this frequency, like this many times in roughly this area. Uh, what Jess wanted was a more level-crafted approach where she could hand place a lot of the um, obstacles in the scene. For the tutorial. Yeah, and yeah, for the tutorial. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Interruptions are bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I kind of uh, panicked a little, a little bit and just thought, oh, it's a little bit difficult. I'll try to shoehorn in an editor. So I made a really confusing text editor without talking to Jess first, showed it to her, and yeah, it was really confusing to use. So, I mean, we came away from this situation thinking, oh, we, made, we both made assumptions. I, I just immediately assumed uh, that a tool would be usable instead of actually talking about it and talking about the components. Um, and Jess uh, assumed that the game could be uh, easily you know, switched from like procedural to level crafted. And if we both talked to each other, we could have uh, figured something else out. So what we could have done is, uh, you know, ask more questions rather than assuming things. Uh, we could have uh, clarified uh, key points in our own words. So usually it's good to say, oh, so you, you're, what you're saying is this and make sure that you rephrase it rather than just repeat exactly what someone has said. Uh, if you think something is task-based, it results in something that you need to do, then you should say, oh, you, so you want me to do this? And while not all uh, programmers are literal, it, is, it can be common for designers to ask programmers to do something, and they will do just that and nothing more than that. So it's usually good to draw diagrams out and figure out what needs to be created from that as well as the components and you know sit down and have a meeting about uh, you know what the components should do and stuff and, mm -hmm. and yeah having an iterative, uh, iterative uh, design approach to it because you're not going to be able to get it correct the first time. 
And it's not just about being a, someone being super literal. It can also be, as the person asking for the tool, um, being like, yes, this is what I need. I need a level editor. Full stop. That's good. You do it. Um, it's about making sure that's like, this is what I will be using it for. Uh, this is what I expect the process to be like. Is that possible? That kind of thing. So for programmers, it's always good to, you know, uh, I know how tempting it can be to work on editor tools that are just going to improve productivity in your project and it's just going to make everything faster. But before you do that, it's actually good to talk to your designers and artists who will be using that tool um, and figure out you know, what needs to be done. So it's always good to start with the bottlenecks first, so talk to them about what their process is. If you find anything that's really repetitive it's always and takes a long time, it's usually good to make editor tools for that. Um, also plan for modifications as, you know, uh, the stuff that you didn't think about. Also be aware that polish changes to games are necessary. Um, while there's different uh, stages in game development where they might not need to be added. It's always good to write them down because you can easily forget these. And if you receive any tasks that uh, seem way too difficult, it's always good to clarify because sometimes you could have misunderstood something. There have been times where I've thought, oh, this is going to take eight hours and I've discussed it and I was like, oh, it's actually just going to take half an hour. So it's always good to you know, uh, talk it out. If it's still too difficult, then you can discuss other ways, like how important is this task to them? Are there alternate you know, pathways to do this? Um, yeah. Cool. So on the management side of things, um, again, as someone sort of overseeing what's going on, uh, you can work to facilitate improvements. So you can encourage discussions when there is a mi miscommunication going on. Um, and again, as I said earlier, it's not about letting blame. Um, as, a, as a third party, someone step back a bit, you can actually be like, oh, okay, I see where the miscommunication happens. How can we work towards it? Maybe next time you try this, maybe next time you try that. Uh, because when two people are kind of arguing about a thing or getting into a disagreement, it can be really hard to step back and, and be like, oh, I did something wrong. Yes. <laughs> Documentation, we all love documentation. Um, it's great as a starting point, good to have it as a location where people can go, go back and check it, but it's good to let it, give it room to grow. So there's some instances where you're like, no, this is the Bible for our game, we'll never change it again. Um, but as each department keeps updating things and changing, the game can kind of move off into separate directions. So by making sure everyone's on the same page, being like, hey, programmers, we made a bit of a change to the way we're doing level design. Then you can talk it out and be like, oh, nope, bad choice, and move on from there. Um, and having a clear product owner is super important. In the larger studios, this is kind of like, <laughs> obviously, but in a smaller group, it can be hard. If you've got two people working on a concept and you both feel like you have equal stakes, who gets the final decision? Like, nope, we have to go with this style. No, we go with this one. We're both just gonna work on our own things and it's not gonna work. Um, so deciding before it comes to a head who gets sort of the final say on what the vision for the game is, is really important because then you can get to a point where be like, yes, okay, I see we're coming from different areas, but as the product owner, I'm going to say, this is what the game needs to be going forward. You can be like, okay, yep, fair enough. That's what we decided. Um, and then as the team gets larger, once you start having multiple people in an area, art or programming, still having one person who gets that final say. Um, if everybody feels like their opinions have equal weight, it can be really hard to move forwards when differences in values come up. Final notes, we did it, almost, there's more things. So as I said, keep repeating it, there's no right or wrong communication style um, or knowledge style, it's not like, ugh, these guys are jerks. Um, having lots of different people in the team is great because it facilitates different discussions, you kind of, everybody benefits from having uh, different people to work against. Uh, next one. So as, again, as I said previously, the styles aren't fixed. It's not a situation where it's like, you are always this type of communicator. You might find that on different projects, you have a different role in a different situation. Maybe you'd work in two different jobs, one you're more of a driver, one you're more expressive. You'll tend to be on a similar side, but that's not how it always is. And you know, as we get older, maybe we move into a different section as we have different values. Um, next one. And 
the communication styles and knowledge styles that we've been talking about, they're good to think about in, in terms of the dynamic of your team, but it's not the be all and end all. It can just help you talk things through a bit better. So you might have situations where there are personality issues or um, you know, introversion, extroversion, all that kind of thing. Um, there's also other aspects that can impact on communication or make it work better, depending on who the people are in your team. It's about you know, communicating with other people and trying to figure it all out. Cool. Communication is a two-way street. Um, it's important to be a good listener. It's important to try and understand where the other person's coming from. But if that other person doesn't want to engage with you in that way, if they're not really invested in the communication, then it's not really going to be helpful. Um, in this situation, there's a quote from my mother that I like to share um, because I feel like it's really important to remember. Some people are just dickheads. <laughs> this helped shape me as a person growing up. <laughs> I'll tell her, I'll tell her one person clapped. She'll be appreciative. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica, she'll say. Um, so effectively, communication is great, but you can't communicate with somebody who's being a jerk, basically. So try your best to understand where other people are coming from. That's great, work, to work through communications. But if someone is just trying to be difficult, they don't value communication, they don't want to be involved, then you know, you've done your part and that's what insp what's important. And you need to try and foster a, a, a team that can work together, good knowledge sharing, good communication, and bring in people who value that. Um, there was not another point, but I've forgotten it. So we'll skip to the next slide and I'll get back to it. What to take away? So handy dandy, all the information in one shot if you want to take a photo of it. Um, the gist is, even if you don't remember necessarily what the communication styles or the knowledge sharing styles are, it's about reflecting on what you value, how fast you go at things, talking it out with other people, um, showing that you value other people's opinions because when you want to spend the time listening to somebody, it doesn't matter if you're coming from different angles, you can get to a, a resolution in the end. Um, give yourself time to think things through, process information and other people. Um, when in doubt, clarify, ask questions, clarify again, it's always good. Um, and just in general, being aware that people are coming from different places and that's okay, we're all different, that's all good. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please let us know. You're also more than welcome to tweet at me on Twitter. You can tweet at Amos, he won't reply, um, but I will ask him for you. <laughs> um, I'm also more than happy if you run into us in the hallways, feel free to, to have a chat with me. I like talking with people in person. I am a very amiable, moving over to expressive sometimes when I'm being difficult kind of personality. Amos more on the analyst side of things. So if you have questions, feel free to send them long form to Twitter and he'll think about them and get back to you later. Good. Thank you. <laughs>be good so sometimes you know I, I love asking other people's opinions yeah what do you think what is this what's going on um, but sometimes it's like look all the decisions have been made by now so we can talk it out and see where we are but really we can't change things at this stage and that can be good as well because people who want to confer a lot um, might go off on a tangent and be like oh you know but why not this why not that why not the other it's like well no these decisions are already made so we'll come back to the point so yeah the clarifying at the start it's good yo Um, well, I guess it's, it's about seeing whether somebody will come to the table when you've alerted them to a problem. Ah, I have remembered the point I forgot before and I will bring it into this. So effectively, if you're in the room today, it's highly likely that you value communication or that you can see it as a worthwhile area in terms of your tasks and doing work. So it's quite possible if somebody doesn't value communication at this stage, they don't see it as relevant, they are not here today. So feel free to be like, wow, what do you think about Amos and Jess's talk on communication? I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts. So they will read through it to give you their opinions. Um, so once you've alerted someone to the fact like, okay, there's an issue here, we need to work through it, you know, you can let them know a few times, maybe like, hey, look, we're having an issue, let's talk it out, I'm coming from this angle, you're coming from this angle, we need to work through it. Um, once someone's aware of the problem, 
if they don't improve, then that's on them. You've done your part in trying to move forwards. Uh, and when it starts impacting on the team that, you know, we've alerted them, they're not trying, okay, now we need to do something about it. So once you know, the responsibility is on you. Hi, I assume this is related to time. All right, cool. <laughs> Other questions? Communication. That's cool. You're welcome to come chat to me afterwards. And again, messages on Twitter, that's good too. Good. Thanks. Stay still so I can photo you. I didn't do it. <laughs>